And let's just dive straight into the next bit, which is, you know, once again, really, what is, what is holding back made in Africa? And in particular, one of, one of the things that's, that, 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 to my mind, and, uh, and, and, and we're going to discuss this, is, is the fact that Africans are not trading enough among one another. Uh, there's a stylized fact out there that we all quote. Uh, to be honest, no one knows whether it's true, but that intra-African trade is, you know, about 12% of, of all African trade. Uh, you know, you take that up, you know, into the, into the, into the 50s, 60s, and 70s, once you get into, into economic blocks like, like the EU. I should take off from uh, one of the things Shagun said uh, during the session you had with him, Jonathan. And that's the conflict between the need for profit and development. How does he, as a commercial banker, maximize the profit to his shareholders at the same time do what he said earlier, create the entrepreneur. That's quite a challenge. And that's what a Frexin Bank was created to do. We take that with pride, and we think it's possible. It is that mix of out of this floor, building a good young set of young entrepreneurs and telling them that there is hope, find the money, and tell them the shareholders are prepared to wait. So we're not looking for the 22% profit straight away, or interest rates are the 22%. We think you could get at a lower rate, wait a little longer, long-termist, and you'll still make it. And that combination is a hard one to achieve, but we think it's achievable. The, I must also thank the organizers for making it possible for us to meet here today. We thought we should let you see a few statistics about African trade, just maybe one or two indications. Share of global trade is just 3%, even though we represent 20% of the world's population. Intra-African trade itself, depending on uh, what institution is producing the statistics, would be somewhere between 14 and 18 percent. It's varying within that range. It's come up quite much from what it was some uh, 10 years ago. But that's still very small. We need to trade amongst ourselves. Why do we have to trade within Africa? for the reason which the organizers of this conference have stated, that is, made in Africa. We think there is a combination, there is a relationship between the trade and making in Africa. We now have as a strategic plan, the existing strategic plan of the African Export Import Bank, two key pillars, intra-African trade and industrializing Africa two key pillars. There are a few others, but those are the two key pillars. Intra-African trade and industrializing the continent. Now, you don't industrialize the continent unless you are making in Africa. We think, and we would like to thank the organizers again for taking this team up at this very time when we've just started a strategic plan which is also based on making in Africa, industrializing the continent. And the idea is that we need to create. We must produce the items that Africa needs and the rest of the world needs from Africa. And we thought that is possible if we support the productive sector, the actual productive sector. And in a Frexin Bank, we think consistently that 95% and in a bad year, maybe 85% of our resources should go into the productive sector. We wouldn't invest in market instruments. We think there is tremendously much to do in the continent. The challenge is extremely high. And we think putting the money, the resources that we have, into the productive sector is 
quite far too significant for us to have the money in market instruments, even though the market instruments could be a little bit more uh, rewarding and safer, especially if those instruments are outside the continent. So most of that should go into the creating. Then we do the connection. There is need to create entities we should ensure that that which is produced reaches the market. The market domestic within the countries and the, mar uh, um, within the, countries and the market that exists in neighboring countries or in other sub-regions of the continent. That's what the connect is all about. And we think that can be done in some cases with trading houses. There is the deliver. The deliver, the delivery is the logistics. There is need for some major investment in the logistics that take that, would, to take that production right. And why do we have to do all of this? Why do we need to support intra-African trade? The table that we indicated to you, if you look at that table, it seems to, there seems to be a correlation. What the table says is that some parts of the world are trading more within themselves than with the rest of the world. So you would see in Europe that a good 68% of the trade is within Europe. And you would see in North America what the figure is. In Asia, it's somewhere around 62%. If you go further down to Africa, the figure is significantly lower. We think there is a correlation between how regions trade within themselves and development. And that's what we're trying to address. And we address them through those three pillars. We create, we connect, and we ensure the delivery. To do the creation, we need to industrialize. Contrary to what most of you may think here, there is plenty of money out there. Shagun mentioned that as soon as he, he retires from GTB, Shagun would be looking forward to creating a private equity fund. There are many already, and in a Frexin Bank, we're actually trying to do, create a, joint, a venture fund right now. Um, the board has approved that. The implementation is ongoing, and there is plenty of money we've received from China Exim Bank, from the Arab Bank for Economic Development to do just that. But money is not the lack of it. The real problem, Jonathan, is that we do not have the skills to create the opportunities for the bankers and the private equity firms to invest. That's project preparation. And that's more human resource driven. And maybe that's where we see the link between a huge part of the audience here, the young entrepreneurs who need the resources, but we need the innovation. And we think a project preparation fund, where we do the preparation for the projects and make it possible for a GTB, which is a commercial bank and is looking at the short-term profit, to see the need to invest. And we would like to expand that so that we can deal with the industrialization, the development challenges. The money is there. The private equity funds have been creating all across Africa. They take the view that we are next uh, uh, frontier for growth. And but they cannot find the opportunities into which to invest. Made in Africa, how do we intend to achieve that? We think there is some other support we should be providing across the board in industrializing the continent, in ensuring that value is added. The question is about value addition how we add the value and get the industrial products out of the continent. I think, ladies and gentlemen, we thought we should give you that short one. And Jonathan is telling me we have to move on. 
So let's move on with the question series, please. Thank you. I think the discussion and the questions from, from, from the audience will be great. Yes. So if, you, if, you, if you've got a few more slides, I need to whiz well, through them. I can let you. Are you happy to? Great. I think you raised some, some, some really important and interesting points there that touch on both the kind of private sector, the lack of opportunities, as well as some of the major impediments to trade. Um, if I had to ask you just very briefly to say, we're gonna, what are the top three impediments that you see right now? I mean, is it kind of, you know, governments and non-tariff barriers? Is it, you know, the insufficiency of, uh, of firms and lack of capacity? Is it just lack of basic infrastructure? What sort of how would you prioritize the issues that, that, that need to be dealt? The priorities, again, <clears throat> the issues are many. The challenges, as you put them, they are numerous. Infrastructure, poor information flow, that's a symmetry of information or the lack of it entirely. Um, skills. Government, lack of government support or vision in government. But we think, um, quite truly, most regions also face similar challenges. Mm. And the solution to it was innovation, vision, entrepreneurship. If we focused on that, the rest would follow. We would build the business class, which, as Shagun indicated earlier, would put the pressure on government for, necessary, for changes to be made in government to support that development endeavor. So it's a need for opportunities to be created. And that's what we as financial institutions should be doing, commercial and development financial institutions. Yes. Chris, I, so, so, so yeah. let's bring you back in here. Yeah. What, are, what, what do you see as the three top priorities that uh, one, one needs to focus on? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me say that the theme of this conference made in Africa coincides very neatly with Afrexim Bank's activities. Perhaps that is why they were invited here. Afrexim Bank, both by mandate and by its specific programs for the next quinquennium, the next five years, are focused on making stuff in Africa. What are the obstacles in front of African by ensuring that things are made in Africa? Uh, the figures you have seen, very little is made in Africa and traded in Africa. In fact, very little is made in Africa. One of the critical obstacles for making things in Africa and trading them in Africa is knowledge. Market knowledge, market information. Uh, I remember many years ago, uh, we provided funding to uh, manufacturers to process African raw materials in Nigeria. And we sought raw materials from near countries. They will be surprised that we're looking for raw materials because for them, African raw materials are supposed to be sold in Europe. Uh, African Bank's president used to say that uh, the notion of an African entrepreneur businessman is that the world market is in London and Paris. It's not in a neighboring country. Uh, so one of the obstacles for making stuff in Africa and trading it is market knowledge. We do not know, we do not regard our neighbor as a market. If we are able to create the instruments that will enable our entrepreneurs see the neighbor as a market, more things will be made and traded in Africa. African Bank is creating a, 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 a program for it to ensure that people know what their neighbors are making. Uh, the second obstacle I would like to mention, of course, is infrastructure. Um, uh, is there, but even on the basis of existing infrastructure, more is possible to be done. 
Thirdly, uh, finance is also a problem. Uh, what Africa Bank has tried to do is to introduce instruments to de-risk uh, supply chains. And by de-risking supply chains, perhaps people like my friend, uh, Shebu, will see less risk in the lending proposals that are put, uh, put before him, and he can put uh, uh, facilities, not necessarily to create billionaires, which I cited as an example, if, for example, a, a, a young uh, London Business School product presented an innovation, would he get a loan even to become, uh, not, a, not even a millionaire, uh, to become, to create a useful institution in garments, would he get a loan? So, market knowledge, infrastructure, and institutions in finance represent some of the key obstacles for making stuff and trading them in Africa. Right, okay, so, so, so now that we've got the priorities for work, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a challenge to you, and I suppose it's also a challenge to Shagan, because a lot of the conversation today has been about making stuff in Africa for Africa. And if one looks at the Asian development model, one didn't see the South Korean tribals emerging saying, you know, we're going to make TVs for South Korea. They said, we're going to make TVs for the world. Are we setting our sights appropriately and saying, you know, we have the, the right level of skill and, and industrial development to make stuff for Africa? Or are we selling ourselves short in not saying we can make stuff for the world? Good point. Uh, the idea is not to make stuff, to, 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 in trying to make stuff for Africa that the rest of the world is excluded. Um, the idea is that when Africans make products to sell in Africa, they learn how to compete in a local league, if you like, uh, as a way of preparing to do business in the larger markets, in the more mature markets. Uh, if they learn how to trade uh, uh, ethnic foods, and by the way, intra-African trade includes trading made in Africa stuff in African diaspora. So if African entrepreneurs make stuff for Africa, learn how to trade them among themselves, then they begin to mature in trading in more advanced markets. It is not because the intention is to, only to make stuff for Africa and not do so for the rest of the world. Great, let's take some questions. I see some hands, and I started on this time last time, so I'm gonna start right at the back uh, over there. I see a hand. Um, hello, my name is Obi Amaka and I work with Mission Foods UK. Um, I have a few questions. Um, I understand that Afrexim's focus is on building intra-trade in Africa, but what countries or regions are Afrexim's core focus for now? What, are, what countries are we focusing on for the next five years? What's our focus in 10 years? What is the map exactly? what does progress look like? And the second question I have is, are there ongoing partnerships with trade bodies in these different African countries that we're looking at, you know, do, um, that we're looking at um, trade, at encouraging trade in? Are there partnerships with BOI? You know, because I am, um, in Nigeria, BOI's main focus is on textile and food production. You know, so if we have, if Afrexim has partnerships with these trade bodies in different countries, we, um, they would have more influence in steering these individual countries in particular directions because most countries in Africa focus on either food production or textile production. And if everyone in the same region is focusing on producing the same things, how do you encourage trade between those, those countries? And um, 
textile is key to the fashion industry and, and from um, the earlier panel we had, um, it was clear that fashion is one of the major focuses in, in Africa as a whole. But then if the whole continent is focusing on the same thing, then how do we get that inter in intracontinent trade to happen? Great. I, th I think we've got it. Could I, could I take the other question towards the middle near the pillar? And then we'll answer them together. So there was a hand somewhere straight on here. Uh, where is that hand? Um, my name is Kelvin Ego. My question is around policies. Um, you've talked about inter-trading within Africa, which I welcome. But it's okay to talk about inter-trade within Africa. The idea is how do you carry this out? Now, within the EU, part of the reasons why there seems to be inter-trade with the EU is because government policies. Uh, it's not just about creating things in EU, within EU. It's about yeah, yeah. having the right policies to encourage that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in Africa... Sorry. Could you just, uh, we're struggling here, could you just speak a little bit? Can you hear me now? There we go. Okay, I'll start again. Um, my name is Kelvin Ergo. So my question is all around, uh, what policies do you have in place to encourage into trading within Africa? Now you've um, showed us a map that showed um, trading across different parts of the world. In EU, for example, part of the reason why you have high into trading within EU is because of the policies they have in place. That is okay for you to talk about um, ways of how you can make things in Africa. But what policies do you have in place to ensure that um, inter-trading in Africa is, um, is, is the thing that, that, that will come to pass? In other words, how do you lobby the government in ensuring that you have the right policies to encourage inter-trading within Africa? Great, what are the policies? And we're taking the last question over here, please. My name is Shay. I'm an alum of LBS. Um, you just said now, sir, that um, the aim is to develop a local league before focus is put on supporting or supplying globally. I wanted to know if there's a long-term strategy for that. And secondly, I'd like to know if there is um, any strategic or um, ad competitively advantageous industry that you have identified that Africa can effectively export. Um, I mean, for probably lack of expertise or um, just a general situation of global markets. So where's the big opportunity is what you're... Exactly. Great. Thanks. Gentlemen, who wants to, who wants to start? Um, thank you very much. Uh, is there a regional focus? Is there, are there preferred regions? The answer is no. no. Uh, African banks' policies are targeted at uh, geographic Africa as well as uh, the African diaspora. Uh, but it does not ignore traditional trade with the rest of the world. So there is no uh, 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 regional uh, uh, preference. With regard to partners, partnerships, um, yes, uh, one, of the, one of the encouraging factors today is that African entities are beginning to go to Africa. Um, African banks are going to African countries, including GT Bank, including uh, several, other, so, several other banks are now going to. And when banks move, they are moving with businesses. Uh, it, it, it appears that the banks follow, follow, follow their customers or go in parallel. African Bank goes as partners or the banks and the businesses. And the idea is that African Bank does those things that commercial entities like banks may find it difficult to do. Take the country risk off them so that they can then do the individual lending. Uh, African Bank has also partnered with people it calls 
uh, champions, regional champions. These are emerging multinationals, really, like Dangote, that now operates in some 14 countries across Africa, producing stuff and selling. And that process itself has meant that in its original country, and the branches it has created across Africa is able to uh, create strength to, 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 to promote trading the items it produces. Can, uh, can I ask George to, to address two, two questions, okay. which are, uh, what are the policies that are lacking you know, uh, to, to, to promote this? What, what should we be telling governments, number one? The policies that are locking in. Uh, so, so the question was, you know, mm -hmm. the EU, et cetera, have, have, have got a strong policy framework to encourage trade. What should we be telling governments or regional uh, trade bodies uh, to be doing? Question one. And I think question two was really about overlap. If we're all uh, making, you know, sort of food processing and fashion, what, what have we got to trade with one another? So how, you know, how does one encourage that diversity? So I'm going to give that to you, George. Well, let's take the, um, the question of diversity. If everyone was producing er the same thing, then where would we be? Textiles was the example the lady right back uh, mentioned. Well, the United States set up Algoa specifically to assist the African countries get those products abroad. Textiles was one of those. So many are invested, but not much investment has gone into textiles. So there isn't much competition yet in textiles in that industry. There is still tremendous, plenty of scope in textiles. Uh, you could do them in Ethiopia, in Egypt, in uh, Lesotho, which tried to develop a major industry in that sector in Mauritius. Um, right across the continent, in fact, Mauritius has left textiles to move into the tertiary sector. So there is plenty of scope there. What we do have to understand is that the um, needs of the continent are vast. The needs across the board. There is enough yet to do. And there is no concentration at all. Uh, get into any line of business and there is still tremendous scope in the continent to explore. In terms of the policies, what should we be advising the governments to do? I think we should be advising ourselves first. We still think in a Frexim bank that the opportunities are with the creators, the entrepreneurs. There, needs, there is need to, for drive. I think I'll do suggest a few examples. We had difficulties trying to do financing in the uh, hotel sector. We tried doing one, refurbishing a hotel in Nigeria some time ago with Shagun's Bank, and it quite didn't work. There was plenty of discussion about government policy not being adapted. Government needed to do certain things and so on. We found out eventually that it wasn't about policy. We just didn't have the innovation. We had a meeting with Shelter Afrique. And what turned out in the course of the conversation, informal conversation with the Director of Operations of Shelter Afrique, was that we had tried to do the hotels in the continent, a need we had seen and we thought needed to be addressed. But we didn't have the skills to understand brick and mortar. That's what it turned out to be. It wasn't about policy. So Shelter Afrique then said to us, if we give them financing support, since we tended to have a better balance sheet, they would take the construction risk. So we told Shelter Afrique, we would put a standby letter of credit or give you a guarantee, and you draw from that when you complete the construction, for that's where the real risk was. You have to put the hotel up, do the building, make sure that it meets the requirements of a Hilton or a JW Marriott or a Sheraton, 
And that's what we were unable to do. And so Shelt, we then put up a product which we called Contour, Construction Tourism. What that meant was that what we thought was a product was just a concept. Yeah. That's an innovative concept, and with that, we were able to do $2 billion worth of hotel constructions across the continent, not in any specific region, across the continent. So, and those hotels are functioning, some with slight difficulties, some as in Mali, we had to reschedule because that hotel was attacked by some terrorists. But that's only a passing problem. We believe in three years, things would be back and we'll be back into money there. So the question we found out was not about policy, it's that we were lacking in innovation. We have to think. And we now find out the governments come to us to drive that particular sector. And if we tell them what to do, they do. Um, we, there is need for innovation, ideas. Bring the ideas, see what we do, and we have significant leverage in countries across the region. Chris, you, you have a... Yeah, uh, if I had to speak to African governments about what, in addition to what my brother here is saying, I will ask the governments to introduce policies in three areas. Very considerable volume of African trade today is informal trade. African governments should take steps to formalize that trade. Uh, the trade is carried by, usually by itinerant trading women, and they represent signals of what is tradable. Fast moving consumer goods, they, give, they represent signals of what, what is tradable. And nobody would know that those items were tradable before we suddenly saw the women moving them across borders. One of the things I would recommend is in order for African authorities to know the volume of what is going on uh, to try to formalize this trade so that the actual signals for the production of the stuff being traded should come to the producing entities. I was very surprised many years ago to see Unilever producing stuff in Nigeria. Much of it was being traded in other West African countries without Unilever even knowing that their goods were being traded across the border. And it was not being traded by Unilever itself. So those, that trade should be formalized. Secondly, cross-border infrastructure, cross-border infrastructure. They represent significant investments which private people cannot make. Uh, roads, um, uh, railways, ports. Uh, when you have a port that can serve the country where the port is and landlocked countries. Uh, Mombasa to serve Kenya, Uganda, uh, Rwanda, uh, Rwanda uh, South Sudan, Ethiopia. So, ports, railways, I would recommend that. Uh, that would be my second set of recommendations. Thirdly, I would recommend institutions, certain institutions that are really infrastructure. When people talk of infrastructure, what generally strikes a listener is that we're talking about something physical. It's not always something physical, but institutional infrastructure. Uh, i give you two examples. Many banks, many years ago, did not know the African bank across the border. So you had Nigerian banks. They didn't know banks in South Africa, banks in uh, Kenya, so they couldn't understand the banking risk of counterpart banks. We need to create institutions that will be, uh, 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 bring these entities together. You have uh, British Bankers Association. All the banks know themselves, and they know uh, European bankers. Uh, when you want to carry stuff across borders by sea, you have conference lines. Uh, that aggregate, aggregate stuff that you can carry. So you do not need uh, 
to individually make up tradable or carryable consignments. The conference does it. You need institutions. And the, uh, the authorities should can facilitate this. You know, I just got, yeah. Okay. Very quickly. <laughs> We're standing between people and their tea. <laughs> well, we'll be quick. I'm going to disagree with my former president slightly. Um, he and I, when I joined the bank in 1996, he had started it two years earlier. The, there was a discussion we had and over which we never agreed, formalizing anything, getting governments to formalize anything. The crippling hands of the government sets in and stops everything back. We saw it with a very simple concept which was well developed in West and Central Africa, traditional banking, known somewhere in Ghana as a susu, in Nigeria the same, in uh, Cameroon it's called Njangi. Uh, local people who know themselves very well operate on trust. They sit together, put some money together and give it to one of themselves who has got some goods at the port to clear. No documentation is executed, no paperwork, no commitment other than that he would be returning the money with a slight margin on it, which is not written anywhere. And What happened when the government got involved? Well, the government decided that they were going to create what they called uh, 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 President, what was the term? They put the, the yes. little community banks. Community bank. Uh, and that kills it, is that? Obviously, because the, you then had to get these fellows into cooperatives, create certain kinds of banks, which then needed banking regulation, which had to hire gentlemen like myself and Shegun to help these local people understand what the financial statement is and so on. They were burdened, and then they all failed. It came crashing. The, I know you're trying to, yes, to get okay. me to somewhere. I think take the local mm. ladies who are doing informal African trade, mm. who are very slow to get the government together and formalize it with the scribbling hands. Let them evolve. What we thought we should be doing in, Af in Afrikaan Bank is to create a platform for those ladies to trade and just do their trade normally so that they don't have to move large amounts of money from them physically across the frontier. Kids keep their monies in Nigeria and Naira, do their trade in Naira, and we'll find the CFA francs for them in Cote d'Ivoire with which to do the trading by creating the platform. And also to enable the banks to know themselves. They use that same platform before we get to the government. There is need to build a momentum around something and then get the government to come in there. And once that thing is built and strong, then it's able to fight back if the crippling hands of the government becomes too strong. Great, thank you for that. I'm, I'm, and I'm going to slightly uh, irritate the organizers and, and take one more minute, and it's one more minute, 30 yeah. seconds each. Yes. Uh, I forget, did we give Shagan a, a million or 10 million dollars? Whatever it is, if you had a million or 10, what is the one sector area for Made in Africa that you would personally invest it in? 30 well, seconds or less. I put in, probably wouldn't put it in the sector. I'll do what I said earlier, project development, project preparation. I'll ask one of the gentlemen down here, ladies here, what do you intend to do? And he would give me some innovative idea. Correct. And then I say, we need to do a feasibility study. It's going to cost X amount of money. Hopefully, with that $10 million, I would put the documentation together, which any bank anywhere in the world, the Korean Development Got Bank, Got would it. put the money into it, it and will move. I'll yes. package it there. What would you do with your, your million? Um, I will do the things that uh, uh, Shagu said he will do and compete with him, but, 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 after the garments, foods, I will do fast-moving consumer goods, uh, so I will have three, three activities that I'm doing, and I will support innovative London Business School graduates who come, who come with innovation. I will not run away from them because I wasn't going to support creating billionaires. That's not the real issue. Support creating institutions, as Shegu said. But those institutions will do something, not secret. 
Do something that will make them billionaires. I, 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 we, we, could, we could go on. Uh, tea is outside. Could you please reconvene, I think, in uh, 15 minutes? Uh, so I get a nod from an organizer. 15 minutes. And please join me in thanking these gentlemen for a fantastic session. <laughs>